You may be seated. Lord bless the children and the teachers. Oh, what y'all got to say? Yeah, yeah. Oh, hold on. You love Jesus? You know you've done wrong before in life and you repented? Jesus loves me? Yes, you qualify. Yeah, not right now. We'll baptize you uh, Sunday. We'll get you Sunday. Get them signed up. Absolutely. Man, kids know. Yes, ma'am. Amen. Grandkids leaving the room. Amen. You got a quick testimony tonight? Love to hear from you. Got several. I got to tell y'all a little funny story. This morning I posted something on Facebook about blessings. And I got the idea because I'd gone back through some notes that I had in my Bible from 2014. Wow. And there was a quote in there. It was Second Jerry 2, 2. <laughs> and it was about the first three words were, it's none ya. And he went on to explain about the blessings. And it says, you know, give and even if it hurts, give it up, that type of thing. Well, I had a comment on there from one of our family in Mississippi. And she said, I don't know where that reference is. <laughs> so I replied back to her and I said, well, that was our pastor. He has a unique way of getting a point across. And I said, if we call it Jerryisms, <laughs> I just thought y'all might enjoy that. Oh, by the way, she's a good Southern Baptist lady. Yeah, yeah. Ooh, Them yeah. Baptist folk don't like me a whole lot. <laughs> For those of you who don't know me, I'm Norma or Mandy, right. as I prefer to be called anyway. But when I was 17 years old, my uh, very best friend, we had a, a sad, sad thing happen, not to us, but to another friend of ours. He was accidentally shot and killed. And uh, it just broke our hearts, so we went to church we went to this church all the time and we talked with the pastor about being baptized and he took us in and baptized us it was a baptist church by the way <laughs> and uh anyway that made us feel much better but as years passed i started going to the methodist church so Anyway, now I'm here and glad to be. Thank you. Glad to have you here, man. Today, Kayla went to the doctor for her uh, physical so she could play athletics. And I had on the shirt, and, she, and the nurse or the doctor asked me, she said, Do you go to the Little Country Church? And I said, Yes, ma'am. She is a member of um, First Baptist in Kingwood, and their children just came right. to our camp. They're teenagers for that. Yeah, yeah, they're teenagers. And she said they had the best time. And I said, don't the Baptists usually go to their own camps? And she said, yes, but the one that they'd been going to was so far away that they it was getting too expensive and too far, and they were trying to find something closer. And they found our camp through Liz and Larry. Hmm. Um, and so they said, she said, do you know them? And I said, yes, I do. <laughs> so it's just a small world. I just thought it was so, so neat. And she said that she was um, kind of disheartened in her own church. And I said, well, doors are always open. Yeah. Yeah. Go more Baptist. I've been struggling with something that I, a wrong I had done like 25 years ago. Now, of course, I 
confess it to God and ask for forgiveness, but it kept coming up, kept coming up. And ever since Malin's death, I said, I have nothing holding me back now from my walk with God, yeah. and I'm doing everything he wants me to do. Well, then just several weeks ago, you preached about fixing a wrongdoing. Mm -hmm. I thought, okay, it's still coming up, it's still coming up. But then the last thing you said was, but if it makes it worse, just let it be. That's right. That's restitution. I thought, oh, there's my out. Yeah, there's your, <laughs> that's your loophole. <laughs> if you're looking for a loophole, there it is. <laughs> but the other night, the Holy Spirit would not let it go. I could not sleep. And he said, time is getting short. So I went and fixed that wrong, and you wouldn't believe the peace that comes over you when you do what God tells you to do. Amen. It's good, sweetie. That's good. I commend you. <laughs> After 25 years. <laughs> but things get right. Amen. Somebody else real quick? 1 Corinthians chapter 13. 1 Corinthians 13. Again, I will echo what we talked about Sunday. Be careful with all the distractions that are going on, particularly in our country, because they are simply that, distractions. You are from another kingdom. You're ambassadors of the kingdom of heaven. Scripture says, seek first the kingdom of God, and all these things will be added to you. I can promise you this. This generation can never make right what past generations have done. We're never going to be able to turn things or change it, and, and it's going to be the same way with the next generation, with our generation. So, you know, when I, when I say that, I actually had a man come up to me, and I'll just be honest with you, he's a very um, white man. And after church Sunday, he said to me, I've never seen anybody be able to deal with politics the way you do and be able to say it in a way that makes me walk out of church mad at myself for acting the way I think. You know, and I think that's important because the issue is not about race. There's only one race. It's the human race. The issue is over pigment, and you did not get to pick your pigment. I mean, God got to pick. I was talking with Joe Ramirez today. I said, do y'all have these problems in Mexico? He said, oh, yeah, well, they come up from south, south of the border. You know, we got the border here, but he said south, south of the border. He said, and they come up from Argentina, Colombia. He said, there's a lot of uh, problems in, in uh, Mexico uh, with pigmentation. I said, what's that? And he said, I said, how do you know? I've just got to be honest, okay? How do you know if they're not Mexican or not? I just had to ask the question because I don't know. And he said, well, if they come up from south of the, south of the border, they're darker because they've been near the equator. I went, oh, okay. He said, then we pick them out, and they pick on them. And I went, oh. So every country has some issues. The issue for us is to maintain our in the word of God and not to get caught up in all the little things that are going on. I'm telling you, you got North Korea aiming nukes at us. You got, you got uh, Iran over there doing, you know, and, and we get all distracted and fighting among ourselves, trying to re-incite something. There, there has to be some type of unity. So, again, Josiah asked me, he said, well, what are you going to teach tonight, Pastor? I said, I'm going to teach on simplicity. Because if there's one thing I've learned in life, it's not to make things complicated. And sometimes the gospel, for some people, get too complicated. And, and then you get preachers that try to shoot over everybody's head. So some of my favorite thoughts were put into a little, uh, uh, just kind of shoved into things here. And with those like... You know, I hear Valerie quoting something from 2014, and then I think, oh, I wanted to preach that next Sunday. <laughs> I, I, I know, you know I'm going to do it anyway. But because but after you've been pastoring for uh, over what, 24, 25 years now, you, you, you have to go back and bring people forward, the new people. And we had so many new people. And by the way, good to have guests here tonight. Uh, you guys, have you been here before? All of y'all been here before? So they all received. You say, now, did you get bread? That makes me happy. Amen. Uh, that makes me happy. Uh, simplicity. The issue is the simplicity of life is this, when you understand. And, and we were created to love. Arms, heart, emotions, things of us. We were created for that. And it is the reason for our existence is to learn how to love. Uh, love God. Love one another. These are the two great commands upon the human race. Jesus told the lawyer to love the Lord thy God with all your heart, soul, and strength and love your neighbor as yourself. Tell me if we don't learn to do this, if it would not solve most of the problems we have in, in our world. Right. That if I would love God and I love my neighbor, you know, and anything about my neighbors, my neighbors are coming to our church now. 
uh, you know, they, well, you know them, Pat and Cindy. But, but there are other neighbors that I'm out to reach and want to connect with. And neighbors aren't just the one that lives next door to you. It's the people you run into. So if we love God with all our heart, soul, and strength, and we love our neighbor as ourselves, we fulfill the great commandment. You know, the lawyer, uh, that rich young ruler was not able to do that. He was not able to turn away his stuff and even think through that. But this is what Jesus said. If you would learn to do this, you would take care of all the Ten Commandments. So to me, the simplicity of life is this. We're here in order to learn how to love. It is really quite an, a, 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 what would be the word? Uh, I always say it, epiphany. I said it right. Uh, I, and I, I use words like epiphany and paradox and paradigm. I'm learning all those words. <laughs> Y'all look them up. They're really cool words to use when you're teaching. Okay? No. When the truth, Google it, when, when the truth finally strikes home. It, and it might be the most liberating realization we ever come to. We're here in order to learn how to love. It is our greatest mission. Amen. When we are full of anger, it creates an atmosphere of poverty, depression, and hatred. When you're full of this, actually, I could flip that and tell you this. When you're full of hatred, you're full of poverty, depression, and, and anger. Because anger comes out of hatred. But when you've got anger seething inside of you, these are the things that will come out of you. But when you're full of love, it creates an atmosphere of forgiveness, kindness, gentleness, and peace. When the love is there, it shifts and changes everything. And I can tell you this. First, it's got to start in your home. Then it's got to work out from your home before you can reach other people. So first, that love has to be there. Accomplishments without purpose are a waste of time. It doesn't matter what you do. If you don't understand why you are doing it, you just waste it. If you don't know why you are to love people, Love people that are different from you. If you don't understand the why you're loving them, then, then you've messed up. You, one reason we love is for God so loved. And we want to be more like him. Can I get an amen? amen. Look at Corinthians 13.1. If I speak in the tongues of men and angels but have not love, I'm only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains but have not love, I am nothing. If I give all to possess to, uh, that I have to the poor, surrender my body to the flames, but have not love, I gain nothing. In other words, he's saying you would give your body up, but you don't know why. You, you, you would give uh, your, your, all your monies up. And when I'm reading this, I'm thinking to myself, I know people who have built ministries. I know people who have built uh, businesses off of all knowledge, having faith, all of these things. But the, the issue here is can you have all that and not have love? The answer is yes. There are people that have gifts in their life, but they don't have love. There are people out there that surrender stuff, give things away, but they'll do it for one, but they won't do it for the others. They, they, they don't have love. He said, if you don't have love, if love is not your motivation for this, then why are you doing it? If you give everything to the poor or you sacrifice your body to be burned, but you don't understand the purpose for doing it, all you have is a dead body. There's no reason for it. God is not impressed with religious or moral acts unless you know why you're doing them. That's why we say around here all the time that a ritual should reflect reality. If you're taking communion, it ought to reflect reality. You're getting baptized, it ought to reflect reality. When we do things like that, it needs to reflect something, that there's something about this. You know, um, again, a monument is just a movement that stopped. And we don't want that. We want to keep on moving. Man without God is lost and confused. We need God more than anything. It's the answer. We are absolutely lost and confused without him. Psalm 82, 5 tells us they know nothing. They understand nothing. They walk about in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are shaken. I said, you are God's little G. You are all sons of the Most High, but you will die like mere men, and you will fall like every other ruler. Uh, this is the word of the Lord to people that don't know God. They know nothing, you know, and they, they prove it by opening their mouth. I told you a couple weeks ago, I can shut my mouth in any language. You try that one, Liz. Okay. <laughs> Without purpose and direction, we will live in confusion and abuse. We'll abuse our time and our resources and others. Without vision, we cast off restraints. People perish. It's important to know why you do what we do. We're children of the Most High, but we live like people without purpose and direction with a broken compass. When you know God, it changes everything. It should give you direction. God's purpose for man is simple. If you don't know again your purpose, then it's, it's impossible to fulfill it. Thus, the release of your potential requires that you learn why God created you. So we're going to talk about some reasons why God created you. But let's, let's talk about this issue of purpose right here and, and finding it out. It should be the most exciting thing of your day to wake up and think, okay, i got to find purpose today. i got to find a reason for being and why I'm here. Uh, you know, I, I think if you, colleges ought to teach Purpose 101. 
Destiny 202. Legacy 404. That's on your way out. Colleges ought to teach why you're here, why you do it, instead of milking them and taking their money and teaching uh, crazy stuff that ain't going to matter in life. Teach them something about purpose. Teach them. And, and for me, I think, okay, now I'm a king's kid, so here I'm here to give the image of the king, to do what he wants me to do, to, to look like him. But it's so important to understand and start discovering it. And that is the joy in life, no matter what age you are, to start discovering the why you are here. And you'll find out it's like a flower. It just, it just keeps on unfolding. You'll find something that was good for a season in your life, and then you shift to another season. But it's always important to find purpose, because if you live without purpose, then you're not going to have a tomorrow. And tomorrow is so important in your life because there are people that need you tomorrow. It ain't about you. It ain't about you. It's about other people that need to meet you tomorrow. It's other people that need to get connected tomorrow. When you get selfish and think it's all about you, then you get depressed, you stay home. But if you'll get up and you'll start moving out and say, now somebody today needs to meet me. And then you go out and you meet them. God's purpose for man, again, is so important. First, we're created to express God's image. That goes back to love. The Scripture says, let us make man in our image. God is it's so simple, and yet we miss it so easily, is love. 1 John 3 says, this is the message you heard from the beginning. We should love one another. Verse 14, we know that we have passed from death to life because we love one another. Sunday, I told you one of the great earmarks of knowing that you've been born again and your life's changed is that you've gone from being an orphan to being adopted, from being a stranger to being a citizen, from leaving out of darkness into light. And it is so important when you realize that love is this, this important thing again. We know that we've passed from death to life because we love one another. When you start loving the people you used to never love, care for, or like. And I, again, let me give you another a little loophole, sweetie. I love everybody, but I don't like everybody. Now, is that a cop out or what? I hope not. Because there's certain things that people do that really aggravate me and, and, and insult my intelligence. Uh, they, it, it rubs me wrong, and they know they're rubbing me wrong. Now, I can love you. I might even take a bullet for you. I might jump right in front of it to prove to you that God loves you. But the bottom line is, I, I just don't like everybody. I don't think Jesus liked everybody. I think he loved everybody. But he didn't like, he didn't like the Pharisees, Sadducees, Herodians. I'm sure he did. He wasn't real fond of the guy that drove the spike into his hand or the one that shoved a spear into his side because they lacked understanding. But there was still a love that came from him. It may, maybe I'm trying to, uh, again, look for a loophole out of certain things. But, but there's certain, thing, certain things about people I, I just don't like. Maybe it's just their attitude, what they are. But then I see their lives changing. And, guys, there's, there's a multitude of people I know that at one time I did not like them, but now I can tell you that I love them. They, they've changed, and I do like them. You know, I, it just wasn't about tolerating. I, I, I liked it. Expecting, expressing God's image has to do with the way you act, not the way you look. God is not, not three-piece suit. God is not uh, bow ties or, or bandanas. God, God you know, it's, it, it's how we express our lives toward him. Again, how does God act? I'm glad you asked. First Corinthians 13, we go back to it. Look at this verse again. Love is patient. And God is what? Love. So all I got to do is take the love out and put God in, and I didn't hurt the Scripture at all. So God is patient. God is kind. God does not envy. God does not boast. God is not proud. God is not rude. He is not self-seeking. He is not easily angered. He keeps no records of wrongs. Somebody was talking about, let's talk about the past here. Many times in life, we, we keep the records of the wrong. We got a file cabinet that we keep, and it just, but God said, listen, when I forgave you, I keep no records of wrongs. I don't go back over all your stuff. That is the hardest thing for a human being to deal with is the records of wrongs. But love does not keep a record. It does, it's, it's washed away. He keeps no records. The Bible says he casts our sin as far as the east is from the west. God does not delight in evil but rejoices with the truth. God don't get excited because somebody was mean to somebody else, but God got it rejoices in the truth. God, God's not a, a bully here. Amen. God does. He always protects. He always trusts. He always hopes, always perseveres. Verse 8, God never fails. 
Love never fails. There's no failure in God. God made us to act like him, to reflect his nature. You know, you can look religious, and you can act like the devil. But it's important when you start looking and say, okay, now what, what am I here to do? You are here to express the image of God. How are you going to do that? 1 Corinthians 13, start loving people. Start doing it. Well, pastor, that's harder than you know. I know it's hard. I know it's hard. I, you know, I get around people all the time that, that, that struggle with me and me with them. But you still got, you can still love. And then sometimes you just shut up until you figure it out. Amen? Number two, we're created to enjoy fellowship with God. When God saw Adam in the garden, Adam, where are you? God came to the garden in the cool of the day to enjoy fellowship. Of course, they had to eat of the peach or the apple or the banana, whatever it was. They run out of the garden. Sin has entered in. Therefore, the opportunity for fellowship was part of the reason God has created us. God created us to enjoy fellowship. And, and I know that this is a hard thing for some of us because we want something tangible. We want to touch something. We got, we got to be around them. But, but fellowship with God is... Uh, uh, it's, it's not just being with his people, but, but it is reading the word. It is praying. It is thinking about him, uh, the image of God, what you think he looks like. All of these things in your mind is so important. Again, how big is God that he can come and hang out with all of us at one time, but to fellowship with him. When I worship, when I worship is one of my most valuable times of fellowship because I shut you out. I shut the world out. I take just this moment, and I say, God, I know I've only got a few moments, may have just a few songs, may have just a few prayers, but I just want fellowship with you right now. I want to tell you, you're the most important one I know today, and I thank you for changing my life and turning things away and turning things around. You didn't, have, you didn't have to do that. Fellowship is companionship, a mutual sharing of an experience, an activity or an interest. When God is so interested in you, whenever there's an activity going on in your life, he wants to be a part of it. You mean God wants to be a part of me floating down to Guadalupe with a... No, well, uh, yeah, God wants to be a part of your life. And I think you need to remind yourself of that. Wherever you're at, that you have God with you, and he's fellowshipping with you. So be careful where you bring him. Amen. Just, just a little thought there for you. That, that's why there has to be a born-again experience in your life, because God ain't going to fellowship with you unless you are. Number three, we're created to dominate the earth. Genesis 126. Then God said, Let us make man in our image, in our likeness, and let them rule over the fish, the sea, the birds of the air, over the livestock, over the earth, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. This is a hunter's dream verse. If you like to hunt, you need to memorize this verse. That God gave you dominion. If you like to fish, you need to memorize this verse. God, they gave you dominion over all the fish in the sea, everything that walks on the ground, everything that flies in the sky. If you're a bird man, this is all, this is, this is for you. God gave us the ability to say, okay, now you go out and you hunt your food. You, you know, take care of the earth. But here's the thing here. We, we are created to dominate the earth and not to it dominate us. I bet Richard and I mowed 10 acres today. You know why? Because if we don't, it's going to dominate us. So we're pushing back all the time. The grass, trying to keep it from coming onto the property, trying to maintain where we at, just keep it. Because one thing's for sure, it don't take a day off. The earth keeps on coming. It keeps regenerating. Things get, so you got to keep pushing the trees back, pushing the, you think you keep things trimmed up, looking nice. And it just keeps regenerating, coming back. God said, I created it that way. I didn't, I didn't do this to give you a hard time so you have to work. Work is a part of the blessing, not the curse. Work's a good thing, man. It's not a bad thing. So, so you get in there and you get to enjoy it. See, here's the thing. If you are either going to dominate something or it's going to dominate you. The problem with addiction to substance is the earth now is dominating us instead of us dominating it. That's why many times we need to fast. We've got to shut the body down and say, okay, I'm in control here, not you. It make you do the right thing. Money controls our lives. It controls Wall Street. It moves. It generates. Uh, somebody was telling me today about somebody who's, who's hanging out with some of the rich folk up in, in Dallas and in Jerry Jones world and all that. And I said, they are. I said, then they, ha then they must have money. Oh, yeah. Yeah, they run this, that, and the other. I said, that's why. Because personality-wise, I doubt either one of them would like each other. So the bottom line is that money, money just motivates. Money does things. But I've always said money's a tool. It's a tool. 
You've got to learn to use it. Don't let it control you. Money controls lives. We kill for it. We rob for it. We steal. We cuss. We do many other things, despicable things, to get our hands on, on something made out of wood or something that come out of the ground, made uh, gold or silver, and all of this stuff that's really going to be just used as building materials when we get to the kingdom. And we kill for it. We want it more than anything else. Uh, the lack of knowledge or the loss of insight into the purpose of a person or a thing always leads to confusion and pain. You got to know what what is the purpose for this. I drive a diesel truck. A year or two ago, I was in Alabama. I pulled up to a pump. That's a diesel truck. And there in Alabama, they had yellow and green, and and it, and for some strange reason, I saw yellow and I thought yellow is diesel, and I shoved it into the tank and I run, let it run, and it wasn't. It was ethanol free gasoline for some reason folk are all into ethanol free i don't know why but they do that in oklahoma so i filled my truck up with gas i ruined the purpose for the truck and for the next four hours I actually had a biker bring me a little motor. I cleaned out my truck yesterday and found it. A little motor with a hose on it where I could hook it up to my battery and start it, and it would pump it out. I pumped all that gasoline out because I knew if I ever turned that engine over, I was going to ruin it with that gasoline because it was the wrong purpose. When you don't know the purpose for a thing or a person, you abuse them. That's why it's important men and women understand their purpose in life because if you don't understand the purpose for a wife, the purpose for a friend, you will abuse them. Amen. Next one, we're created to bear fruit. I know Valerie loves this one, John 15, 8. I preached a whole series out of this, John 15. I'm in a jam. I remember the titles. I'm in a jam because God wants us to be fruity. Um, sheer love, he prunes us. He, he shears us. All of those things. Just a wonderful set of messages out of this. But the bottom line is, is God doesn't want you to have just fruit, but more fruit and much fruit. God never, did, never stops and says, okay, that's good enough. He keeps one more out of you. Squeeze a little bit more. Press it. How much more do you want, God? Just a little bit more. Give me just a little bit more. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. John 15, 16. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. Then the Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. My joy in this life is that whatever Joseph does while he's here, his fruit remains. That whatever Dick does, his fruit remains. That whatever we do here on this earth, your fruit remains. That's important. That what you did here mattered when you're dead and gone. And I'm, I'm the part of the, somebody's fruit. I did his funeral uh, a Friday. A pastor friend of mine who helped brought me here, helped mentor me for four years. I, I'm a part of his legacy now. You know, so it's important that you look at life and realize that, you, you know, your fruit needs to remain. What you've done here, when, when I'm on over the property today, I had, I had a family there from San Antonio with me. And, and Jeanette, I looked over and I said, you see that bench there? That was my friend Jimmy Roberts. That's what that bench stands for right there. I said, you see that flagpole right there in flowers? That was Bear. Bear passed away too. I said, you see that cross over there? That's Barbara. And all of a sudden these things started got going around Gann Arena. Seeing the arena, you know, just things like that. It reminds me that there are people been in my life who have bared fruit. Walked into the kitchen and I saw all them pictures of them people who have been a part of that kitchen crew that have passed on. You can't forget those. I was thinking even today uh, uh, when I brought up my, my dad and sister on Sunday who passed away last year. My sister and I started crying. I didn't do that to make her tear up. It is in me. I refuse to allow my daddy's memory to die. Or my sister's memory to die. My son-in-law got into cassettes. Why in the world do you millennials get into cassettes and LPs? We left him a long time ago. And yet he's gone back into cassettes. My son got into LPs now, you know, vinyl. And I think, why y'all doing it? And he said, I got 50, 50, uh, I mean, he said he had 50 cassettes or 20 cassettes. And he said, man, I just love listening to cassettes, you know. And because I gave him a truck that has a cassette player in it, so he's listening to cassettes. And I said, well, that's, that's good, John. I'm glad you like cassettes. It's nice. I'm glad I don't have to have cassettes or, what's it, eight tracks anymore. Amen. I don't have room for them. You know, everything's just got small. But here's what I did. I said, Johnny, my sister has over 500 cassettes at her house. 
She'd gone to be with Jesus now. And I was thinking, i got to find out a way I can get Fats Domino and some old Elvis cassettes to you because that's all she listened to. Over 500 cassettes. You know, it's, it's, I don't even know why I got on all that. Oh, yeah, bear fruit. <laughs> memories, what you do here matters there. What, it's so important to keep people's memories alive. Can I get an amen? amen. Why, why do you bear fruit? Why? It's for my Father's glory. It ain't about you. I'll close with this. It ain't about you. It ain't about you. A productive person is simply somebody who will respond to the demand. That's what a productive. Not, not all the time are you asked to do something. But when God puts a demand on you, I talked with my friend today, David Hilton. He said, man, I bet you bake side of camps about over. I said, brother, you ain't got no idea. Because all summer long, you feel this demand put on you. Because not only is there camps, but there's still funerals, there's still church services, there's still weddings. And all that. I mean, everybody's doing something. And you just get to that place where you know there's an ending coming, and you get to breathe. But I'll say it again. A productive person is simply somebody who will respond to the demand. If there's a demand there and I'm gifted to meet it, I want to meet that. Your fruitfulness is related to the food you're eating. If your spiritual source is not of top quality, your productivity will show it. Last point. We were created to worship. I felt like when I found this verse many years ago that it set me free. When God said, this people have I formed for myself, they shall show forth my praise. They, they, they will praise. See, God made us to praise him. And, and again, it's not hard to ask you, say, okay, what's the purpose of God for my life? To bear fruit, be a disciple. <laughs> uh, reflect his image. Love. Let people see love. Let them see it. Kind, uh, not rude. Not self-seeking. No records of wrong. Let them see the image of God in your life. See, the purpose of God is not something that's so far out there. I, I do believe there's specific things in what it's like. That you're gifted for music. You're gifted to speak. You're gifted to serve. You're gifted in... I, I, don't, I, I don't understand buildings. But people can look at a building and tell you real quick how much wood, how much this. They, they, they're just they're geared that way. Electricity. All the things like that. Those are giftings to me. I don't understand. Computers, I'm still trying to find out where the Internet is. It's got to come from somewhere. It, my son tried to explain it to me. He lost me in the first sentence. He knows where it's at. I just want to know where it's at. Where did it come from? How did it show up? What took the place of the yellow book? Seriously, you know? All these things. It just Everything just shifted and changed. It doesn't seem like overnight to us. So I'm here to create. I'm, I'm here to fellowship with. That's a part of my purpose on earth. And I'm here to worship Him. Worship is an outward expression of an inward love. When you love, you express yourself. You're going to show that. You're going to let it out. You can't help yourself. Stand with me. Worship is an outward expression of an inward love. So what are we here to do? I'm here to be like him, express the image of God, and to love. There should be enough lo God's love inside all of us that worship is not a hard thing. You know, one of the things that I've, I've often told Dick is do not berate the people and force them to worship. Don't make them. Don't get up there. Because I've had worship leaders do that before. Come on, you guys. If anybody's going to do that, that's going to be me. Because I know when to say that, or at least I think I do. But, you know, but, but not to beat the people up. You know, if you've got to make you worship, what kind of, that's just trying to make me look good on the Internet. That's no good. Well, won't you just love God because you love God? It's an inward love. There's something going on inside of you. So the simplicity of life is this, learning to love, learning to enjoy fellowship with God, learning to dominate the earth, Misspelt that one. Learning to bear fruit and learning to worship. That's what we're here for. And you can add to that with your own specifics. But that's just simple enough, isn't it? It's just simple. That's not hard. Why am I here? This is why I'm here. Father, I thank you for your people tonight. Lord, I pray as a king's representative that any need they have, I'm believing you for healing in their bodies. 
I'm believing you for a turnaround in their emotions. I'm believing you for a change in their life. God, be real to every person here and every person that's watching us. Be real in their life. Lord, let love start expressing throughout this nation. Lord, I know there's still hope for America yet. So, God, I pray for us. Lord God, that there would be a turnaround, that there would be love in this house. And it would expel and go out from here and reach so many others. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.